uh, just in the interest of time and I'm a planner and want to be on time and all that good stuff. So uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Hardy. I'm the Program Director for Planning and Policy here at AASHTO. And I want to welcome everybody to the 15th uh, Transportation Asset Management Webinar Series that, uh, that has been sponsored by FHWA and AASHTO uh, with support from the, the, um, the, the, the Transportation Asset Management Expert Task Group. Uh, I think we've been doing the yeah since uh, since t since 2012 we have been putting on these uh, webinars. I think they've been uh, well attended. Uh, people like them a lot, so we're going to keep on doing them as as much as we can. The topic of today's webinar is lessons learned from developing a transportation asset management plan. Uh, I think very timely uh, given that the uh, the NPRM on the asset management plan requirements uh, was published uh, back in February. Um, so, and I'm, I'm sure Steve is going to mention this, but comments for that are now due uh, May 29th. So if you're a state DOT, look for information from me. If you're not a state DOT and you want to submit comments, you can do that uh, on your own. Um, so these webinars uh, that we're doing are held every two months um, on topics uh, such as uh, off-system assets, asset management, uh, financial plans, and uh, many others. The next webinar is going to be on, the, the, the topic is, is going to be Transportation Asset Management Financial Plans Part 2. It's going to be held on June 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, that is a follow-on to a, a webinar that we had last October, I believe, uh, that was very well attended regarding uh, financial plans. So we thought that one was uh, such interest we, we would do a Sort of follow on part two. Um, if you want to uh, gain access to the recordings of previous webinars and the, the uh, PowerPoint slides and all that good stuff, you can go to TAM. Dot, um, oh, you can go to the TAM portal uh, by going to TAM-portal.com. Uh, that's TAM-portal.com. Previously, if you went to the asset management website TAM.transportation.org. Um, you could access them there. Uh, you can still do that, but we are transitioning over uh, within the, the AASHTO Subcommittee on Asset uh, Management to a new website, um, and that's going to be the TAM-portal.com. So look for the information there. You can, you know, archives of previous webinars, links, all that good stuff. Um, if you have any questions or suggestions on future webinar topics or have questions for you know, the, the uh, presenters uh, during today's webinar, please submit them um, using the Q&A feature within the GoToWebinar. Um, you should, on, on the right-hand screen, your overall sort of navigation pane, there's a little tab there, a plus sign you can, you can click on for, for questions. Um, so. And we're going to, at the very end of this, we're going to try to answer as many of those questions as we can. Uh, but if, if we do run out of time, um, we can always follow up with, with each of you. Um, you can sort of include your email in there, um, or if you have a, a question specifically for one of the presenters, I'm sure that they would be fine with, with, with trying to talk with you offline, and they'll, they'll provide their contact information, or I can provide that to you as well. Uh, in terms of phone logistics, uh, you may have noticed that everybody, if you're an attendee, you are automatically in a, uh, a muted mode by default. Uh, this helps out with all the audio and stuff. And again, all, those, all the questions are going to be done via typing in via the uh, navigation pane. Uh, presenters should be sure to use their phone's mute buttons to unmute their phone in order to be heard if they did sort of manually uh, mute them. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Gay from FHWA, who also has some opening remarks. Good afternoon or good morning to everyone joining us today. I'm Steve Gay, leader of FHWA's Asset Management Team. Federal Highway, in cooperation with the AASHTO Subcommittee on Asset Management and the Asset Management ETG, is very pleased to sponsor this webinar series. We feel it's a great way to bring people together around a series of important topics and to connect with the asset management community. With this webinar, Lessons Learned for Developing Transportation Asset Management Plans, we reached the 15th webinar in our series. This is a topic that all state DOTs, I'm sure, are following closely, and it's a great practical value to those in the asset management community. As you know, under MAP 21, state DOTs are required to develop and implement a risk-based asset management plan. Three of today's presentations represent the results of a collaborative effort 
the Federal Highway and three state DOTs, Louisiana, Minnesota, and New York, to pilot the TAMP development process. You know, one of the big areas, one of the reasons why we did it, we kept on getting asked, but what does an asset management plan look like? Is there a template? What should we be doing? And I think a key of this webinar, and as you visit the FHWA Asset Management website, just visit the FHWA Asset Management website, or you can get it from the portal. Take a look at some of the other asset management plans. It may be a good catalyst for ideas of, huh, maybe I could do this a little different, or this a little better. I think you get some real good ideas from each other. Also, today we'll have a presentation from Colorado DOT, which we're not one of the pilots. Kind of shows that you don't have to be a pilot state to produce some real good asset management plans. All four of our presentations today will offer practical insights and lessons drawn for the TAMP development process. And I hope they can address the issue of, okay, they developed their TAMP about a year ago. Now what are they doing with it? Or what are their plans for the future? As I mentioned, MAP21 requires states to develop asset management plans. In the MAP21 language, talks about making progress towards state targets for asset condition and performance of the NHS. MAP21 also includes requirements pertaining to the plan development process. So the highway division offices will be certifying processes. To help provide examples for agencies responsible for managing highway infrastructure assets, both at the state and local level, the Federal Highway Office of Asset Management supported these states developing their TAMPs. They helped demonstrate the benefits that come from laying out and writing a process of managing a transportation agencies, highway pavements, bridges, and other, other physical assets for the long term. I think that's the key of the asset management plan, the whole life management of assets. There are many lessons learned along the way. I will leave that to our pres presenters to describe in detail. All the updates and information developed through the pilot project are posted on the FHWA Asset Management website that address is seen on the screen. I do encourage you to visit the site where there are many, <coughs> where there are additional information and resources are available. I look forward to hearing our presenters share their perspectives today. I just want to say that you are going to enjoy today's presentation. As Matt indicated, notice proposed rulemaking is out there. Please make comments to the docket and provide as much detail as you can. Don't just say, I don't understand this. If you have suggestions, they are certainly welcome. Let me turn it over to Yana Park of SpyPoint Partners to give an overview of today's webinar, if you play the agenda, and introduce our speakers of which she is one. Yana, back to you. Thanks, Steve. Today's presentation includes four perspectives on developing and implementing asset management plans. We'll explore the experiences of state DOTs that have been at the forefront in taking on these challenges. Presentations will highlight some of the important lessons learned. Each of these presentations will focus on specific outcomes of an agency's TAM development journey. Our goal is to provide depth rather than broad brush um, looks at their process. We will also address some key success factors that may be applicable for those who are just beginning the process of TAMP development. As Matt mentioned previously, the, pur the purpose of the webinar series is to share lessons learned, ideas, and knowledge with the asset management community. For this webinar, our primary learning objectives are building working knowledge of key concepts and definitions relevant to developing transportation asset management plans, understanding specific approaches that agencies are taking to address this, these issues today, and beginning to apply this knowledge in order to answer how can TAMP development improve coordination between the maintenance, preservation, and capital programs, what benefits can states expect from finalizing in a TAMP the process of managing physical assets for the long term? And finally, what are the key lessons learned for agencies just beginning the process of TAMP development? For the agenda today, we started off by hearing from Matt 
Hardy and Steve Gay. I'll introduce all of our speakers before each presentation, but in brief, we'll have Mark Boris from Louisiana DOTD as our first speaker. Next, we'll hear from Colorado DOT with a presentation from William Johnson. Our third presentation will be from Mark Nelson of Minnesota DOT. And our fi final presenter will be Steve Wilcox from the New York State DOT. We'll have Q&A at the end. Just another reminder, please submit your comments or questions using the webinar Q&A feature on the webinar menu bar at any time during today's presentation. And in response to the most frequently asked question, yes, we will make the slides and video available after today's webinar at tam.portal.com. Our, fir our first presentation is from Mark Barras of Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. Mark has a degree in civil engineering from, from Louisiana State University and has been employed at LADOTD for more than 30 years. Mark's career includes time as a system administrator, a Fortran programmer, a, data, a database administrator, the CAD manager, the GIS man manager, and the automation engineer. He has been um, project manager for numerous software implementations, most recently serving as the project lead for the Agile Assets Maintenance Management System as part of their statewide SAP um, Agile Asset Implementation. He currently serves as the Asset Management Engineer and has the responsibility for, ma for managing the agency's um, activities related to MAP21. And now I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Hannah. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier, um, there were three states that did the pilots, uh, Louisiana, New York, and Minnesota. Kudos to Colorado and Georgia and those states that have already done their TAMPs, too. We were the, we were the last of the three pilot states to finish our uh, TAMPs, so we get to go first today. And I'll begin to provide a little information for everybody. Next slide, please. All right. Back in the days of... Um, about the 1980s, late 1980s, the concept of asset management was being developed in um, what I call a transportation reauthorization bills. It's interesting that Ice-T's first reporting deadline was January 13th, which was a Friday. But in that bill, they established the National Highway System. And they also mandated management systems. Um, two of the management systems were effective today, pavement and bridge management systems. Uh, T21 created the Office of Asset Management, so it really formalized the function of asset management in the federal federal view. And we started paying attention to those kinds of things then, too. Uh, the issue that most of us have is we're busy dragging asset management along behind us while we're doing a regular job. Uh, MAP21 puts asset management front and center, and, and we'll have to address that. And everybody needs to know that they need to address that. It, it always seems to be human nature to resist change. Um, in my experience, I've come to believe there are three ways to create real change. It takes great leadership, you know, usually individuals with vision, but they tend to retire, get promoted, and, and kind of fade away in their vision and everything's lost. Uh, great leadership's been shown by Australia Roads with respect to asset management. They've kind of been uh, the leader in the, in the area when we all started about the same time. Second real way to create change is a mandate. Basically, each one of the reauthorization bill sets its own mandates, uh, many different mandates and different, different requirements. Third way to create real change is a mandate with penalties. <laughs> and a mandate with penalties I like to call a hammer, and MAP21 is the hammer. So like it or not, it's the case. Next slide, please. In today's topic, um, we look at MAP21, we focus on the TAMP mandate of MAP21. You know, MAP21 requires NHS, um, the TAMP requires NHS um, work asset management plan focused on the NHS. Uh, Louisiana chose to include all state maintained payments and bridges in their, in their TAMP. Uh, no other assets we manage have the data 
required to support asset management at this time. And, and data capture, QA, QC, storage, analysis, maintenance, all that stuff costs money, it costs a good bit of money. Uh, we're in a significant statewide short budget shortfall right now, so our executives made a decision to wait for the final rules um, to be finalized, actually, before we decide which other assets to include in our um, TAMP. Next slide. Just to ref refresh what um, they were saying earlier, Steve's mentioned it, I think everybody mentioned it, the, the notice of proposed rules are out right now. There's two rules that affect us. The asset management plan is directly about the TAMP, uh, 052. 053 is the national performance management measures. They were extended to May, and they're very complex. It's 248 pages. If you read every page of every reference they have, you're into thousands and thousands of pages of reading. Uh, lots of comments need to be made in that area. Um, the final rules of, um, for the 053 are in October. Um, I think the TAMP rules are out probably in November. And the TAMP's met, you know, required and due 18 months after that. Uh, we're in a comment period, so uh, you need to study these things and make your comments as much as possible as, as they referenced earlier. Next slide. In Louisiana, um, we focus on these main main points here. Um, NHS pavement management, pavement and bridges. Um, basically, uh, you, you have to have a management system. Ice T required those management systems back in the day for you guys who weren't around back then in '91, but um, they required management systems. Most states have management systems in one sort or another. They may be little mainframe apps or whatever, but they're their stuff in place and they need to move to more advanced management systems. Um, the items in blue in this case are just an indication that at Louisiana we had minimal experience in performance gap identification, life cycle costs, and risk management, or we had no experience, no expertise. You know, we probably have advanced expertise in other items, but when you start looking at the, the MAP 21 rules and notice and things like that and the requirements, there's certainly going to be course corrections, some minor, some significant, that we'll have to address. Next slide. All right. As you go through this effort, these are some additional key focus areas you're going to have to get a handle on. My personal belief, and long and short of is, preservation is the real mandate of MAP 21. Um, of course, rules are always interesting. Many times I, they invoke what I call a law unintended consequences. And um, the you know, example I want to give is early in the interstate days, the federal FHWA wouldn't provide maintenance funds for interstates. So the law, state's logical response was just let the interstate fail to reconstruction and get 90-10 money for replacement. That's pretty much the reason why we're looking at asset management now, in my personal opinion, and, and I think it's a uh, maintenance and management and things like that are, are mandatory and required. Now the proposed rules right now kind of evoke the law a little bit of unintended consequences with respect to moving away from the worst first to preservation because when you, you know, I know that uh, Minnesota has some really good slides about the cost of worst first versus presentation. Uh, I don't think they're in this presentation today, but they really are double, you know, the, very advanced costs when you go worse first over preservation in your cost. But basically the rules kind of have some conflict almost in my opinion when you move in, as far as moving away from first worst. But I, I believe Steve Wilcox in North of New York DOT is going to expand on that subject in his presentation, so I'll leave it to him. He's more advanced and studied that subject anyway. They're ahead of us. Um, next slide. Now, let's focus on the organizational thing. I think this is critical to your success. And in our case, we got lucky. Um, our early executive champion was uh, Michael Bridges. He was our deputy undersecretary. Uh, he was the guy who started all our efforts in this, way, in this thing, got us involved in the pilot study and things like that. But now he's retired. And uh, But he was a great executive champion. He got all the executive level people on this list involved and, and our Secretary of Transportation, our top executive, attended all these meetings along with the executive staff. 
our new executive champion is um, the deputy secretary to number two person, Dr. Eric Calavoto. So we're in good shape in executive management and executive opinion of this project. And, uh, you know, I really think that uh, you need to have an executive that's going to be in a powerful position to help you succeed in this area. Next slide. The, the group formed the core working team, the, the executive committee formed, formed the core working team. Um, as I mentioned, Michael was in charge of that uh, at the time, and now Eric Calavota is, but we had a co-chair, Jason Chapman. Uh, he's over the data collection analysis division, and uh, he's my boss. And then Vince Latino from the maintenance division, which is kind of unique. You know, you, you want to go to full asset management, and of course maintenance needs to be a big deal. Uh, we were doing some software implementations with Agile Assets and some other things, and we're moving in the direction of total asset management, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but those two co-chairs are uh, pretty bright fellows and do a lot of good stuff and are doing a great work. Uh, our consultant uh, did a lot of the grunt work for us because at the time I wasn't in a position asset management area, it didn't exist, so they were to pull in a load of all the day-to-day -day work that you know, like I said, everybody has a regular job, they didn't have time to do all this stuff, so we chose to use outside consultant. Um, they f they kind of realized that because they all had so much work to do, and especially the managers like Jason and Vince, that they had to have a full-time position, so they created asset management engineer, and I took that position in December uh, 2013, this full-time uh, person dedicated to asset management and TAMP. Next slide. The support structure, if you look at it, um, uh, the, I'm in the chain of command under the secretary of the multimodal planning division. Uh, Jason's the data collection management system person, and I'm the asset management engineer. Now, when you look at the uh, the, the lines connecting everything, uh, I communicate with everybody, but the line between the executive champion, um, our deputy secretary, Eric Calavota, Dr. Calavota, should be a solid line. He's very involved, very uh, articulate very detailed and, and reads everything I write. So um, you guys, you know, uh, should have, if you're, if you're lucky like we are, you want to have an executive champion that is, is engaged, very engaged in our case. Next slide. All right. Um, when you look at the TAMP, you know, it's basically a new policy document, and it it talks about how you're going to tie all these different plans together, the STIP and the state long long range plan and all these things. You got to tie them all together. They don't replace the plans, they influence the plans, but the TAMP's pretty much what I call a glue that ties it all together. And, and that's the, the thought process behind that for us. Next slide. This is a little diagram, and I apologize. I didn't realize I was going to do gray on gray there for you. Um, I didn't have time to fix it, but basically this is the, uh, the just a little diagram of how our TAMP fits in with other plans and things like that. Next slide, please. All right, so let's get into the meat of the, um, the things. Our executive management uh, strongly believes, and surveys have confirmed, that our customers only care about ride quality or feel of the ride. As a result, our existing pavement managed performance measures have only been based on IRI. Well, that's fine and, and, and dandy, but it kind of, you know, it, our pavement treatment selections are based on pavement management data, including rutting, faulting, IRI, longitudinal and transverse cracking, fatigue cracking, patching, friction and texture. So we're kind of at cross purposes here. We're, we're disjointed a little bit. We're disconnected. Our payment management system picks stuff based on a bunch of measures, but if we strictly stuck with our um, RI only, we'd never do chip seal or, or service seals or, or seal coats or anything like that. So common sense kind of overrides the performance measure, but MAP21 is more about writing it all down, getting it all right, and make sure you focus on the right thing. So we're going to have to change our performance measures a little bit and go in that direction. So even though we've been doing performance measures for quite some time, probably prior than we're required to, we have to make adjustments. So you're going to have to, you know, your status quo is not going to be good enough in most every situation uh, based on MAP21 and our experience. And we even configured level of service in the maintenance management system prior to MAP21 because we understood we wanted to tie, we wanted to, tie, wanted to get the trade-off analysis at some point where we could 
spend the money wisely among different things. But um, the so we instituted level of services. I don't think it's been turned on. It was configured but never turned on. But we need payment and bridge maintenance data to allow to move the trade off or what some people are calling cross asset analysis, where you spend your money to gain the most improvement. And your full implementation would include payments, bridges, preservation, maintenance, and safety. But you want to focus on maximizing the benefit of your spending. So you're spending dollars on a curve, you know, and you're improving a, a certain area. As long as you're getting maximum improvement with those dollars, it's fine. But when you start that curve starts flattening out, and you're spending a bunch of money to get parts of a percentage point. You want to move it to another area so you have the uh, maximum benefit for your expenditures. And that's our, been our long-term goal for a while. We're quite a ways away from it, but it's something that we want to implement. Next slide, please. When you look at the asset management and objectives, a couple of years ago we switched from um, our, in, in our bridge responsibility, we had to make a switch from um, percent deficient bridges to structurally deficient deck area, by deck area. And that was based on the Katrina Rita storms that we had. They were the same year. Most people just remember Katrina, but Rita wiped out the western part of the state like six weeks after Katrina. And we lost a lot of stuff, but uh, one of the things we lost was the, the twin 5.5 mile long I-10 bridges over Lake Pontchartrain connecting the from New Orleans to the near Mississippi area. It was 3.5 million square feet of deck area, 2.3% of our total bridge deck area in that state. Well, for deficient bridges, we actually improved that year because this only represented two bridges of 0.03% or 300th of a percent of the total number of straight bridges. So clearly we had to switch to deck area. Well, we did, because of this MAP21 stuff, we did a further analysis just not too long ago. And uh, what I determined was 118 bridges carry 47% of our deck area. They only represent 1.5% of our total bridges, but we have some pretty large bridges, and they kind of pose some issues for us. Now, these are things we didn't quite fo focus on, but when you start focusing on deck area and, and 10% and all this stuff like that, uh, basically we could have one load posted bridge that destroys our ability to meet our performance measures. So we're going to require a different focus in, in pre-reporting of repairs and, and updating inspections to, to try to make sure that before we have to report our performance, uh, if we have, like we had a situation where in uh, the West Bank Expressway west of New Orleans, one power cap went out on a, on a mile and a half long bridge and it, it spiked our performance, it killed our performance for that year. So, you know, you, you're talking about 175,000 square, square feet of deck area that went bad because of one power cap. So if you go out there and fix that power cap right away, reinspect it and take it off the list, you're in good shape. So you're going to have to focus your, your measures and do things that you hadn't done before, and that's part of the, the reality of what you're looking at. We look to move to, uh, we're also looking to move to performance-based practical design uh, with our local feds. They're very involved in that, and they're actually very, they're instigating it. Uh, because we tend to replace a lot of bridges and we want to repair, they want us to repair more and replace less. And, but the, the example of law and intended consequences is, um, you know, as I understand it, you know, we don't have to meet the, um, the, the help, you know, help us with the uh, bridge repairs. Um, the performance-based practical design allows you not to meet current design standards which, you know, we built the bridge 20 years ago, 30 years ago, while we're trying to meet current design standards with us. So they've got some opportunities and, and things like that, but uh, you have to look at it the different ways, and you'll have things like that happen to you. So next slide. All right. Well, we, we looked at, um, there's a requirement for gap analysis and stuff like that, and Katie, Katie um, Zimmerman and her group put together the document for the NCHRP 0890A. It's a TAMP analysis guide, but I like to re we redefine it to maturity level gap analysis because we have other gap analysis stuff. Um, it's, it's not to be confused with payment or bridge performance gap analysis or budget gap analysis. It's a different gap analysis. It's like maturity level or your functionality. Um, it's kind of, um, I had some, when you look at it, there's five ranges of material.
maturity and then there's focus areas and you look at the focus areas and there's a bunch of area you know points within those areas that allow you to determine your maturity level and, and I think it's a pretty handy guide to get you a good start on where you're going where you need to be <clears throat> excuse me next slide um, hey Mark I just yes. wanted to remind you that you have about three minutes okay I'll rush through it okay Thanks. All right, life cycle costs, uh, we're very slow to adopt. I believe most engineers are uncomfortable with this. Uh, we we um, like the same status, you know, we're like all states in this area. We, we don't like fuzzy variables. Customer costs with limited traffic data seems to be a fuzzy variable to us. Material costs for 20 years, kind of hard to predict. The asphalt prices and record highs have lately have, you know, changed down to almost no cost and, and there's a lot of issues that we can't quite figure out with life cycle costs. We're going to have a, a lot of work cut out for us in that area, and I think you may too. Next slide. Risk management, um, as I said, we looked at the maturity levels. Uh, we, we felt like we were proficient in risk management because long before Katrina Rita, we had emergency ops section, we had command centers, we had agency level procedures for ops. We had practice hurricane ops every year. Uh, we had contraflow in place long before Katrina and Rita. Uh, you know, we did a lot of things, but when you start really re reading the TAMP and understanding the requirements with risk management, um, it basically completely redefines what we call risk management. And our initial, we're basically at our initial maturity level on that case. We have a, a two NHI courses scheduled this summer. 60 people of our staff with local feds up attending that to get an understanding of risk management. Next slide. Okay, we assume that our maturity level in this uh, thing was proficient in financial plans. We've been doing this a long time, everybody has. We have investment strategies that developed over time that will become a very powerful political influence and try to mitigate that. So we feel we're pretty strong in that area, but it's still going to require adjustments and modifications. Our payment management, bridge management system uh, keeps predicting serious shortfalls, but our TAMP analysis actually made us realize for the first time that we met our performance measures, but mostly due to federal stimulus money and end-of-year surplus funding. So we had a crunch and didn't know it. And the MAP 21, the TAMP stuff, actually raised our performance. One of our secretaries actually had stretch goals for us. We raised our performance measures when we weren't really meeting them with storm normal money. Our local feds require, required in a TAMP analysis that we do a steady state analysis of funding. And it was very enlightening as our target goals allowed us to drop like a rock while still meeting our targets. But the, the steady state stuff is, you know, it's eye opening. We're, we're losing ground. And it's not a good place to be. Our 10 year plan requirements for the TAMP also kind of appear to be inadequate for bridge funding since bridges take much longer to decay, but they do it. And if you look out past the 10 year time frame, our bridges are, are tanking and we're not happy with it, so we have to figure things out. Next slide. All right, my, my expertise is management data as data. Um, when you look at data, uh, you, you think you have great data. We, we have material level proficient. We have pavement management since 93. We have advanced data. But TAMP requires you to look at data in different ways that we never looked at it before. So we had no previous NHS budget partition or data like that. So we have to readjust our, our thinking, readjust our data. Even though we're proficient, we still need to massage it and look at it a little differently. Um, I already mentioned the RI performance measures and those kinds of things. So Anybody who expects that they have perfect data, too, I want to point out that this goes hand in hand with the paperless office world peace initiatives. It's just not real. You're going to have to work your data. You're going to have issues with your data. Next slide. All right, and data gathering issues. Data costs a lot of money. You know, collection, QA, QC, database storage systems, analysis, all these things like that. Um, you're going to have to focus on these points. Your data is going to be your critical element in your TAMP. You have to have good data to have a good TAMP. Next slide. All right. Uh, these are kind of like the the keys, I think. We use data indexes instead of data, so we get roughness indexes and rating indexes and all that, and it allows us to compare them with something that you need to look at. We have a lot of data silos that we're going to have to knock out. 
we just started a, a Esri Roads and Highways project to try to tie those data silos together and eliminate the redundancy. So you get different mileage and different systems and they don't match. So we have to make that happen too. And that's part of this initiative. We were doing that uh, with our asset management plan, but uh, this is just speeding up the process. Next slide. And I'm almost finished. Um, when you look at dealing with data deficiencies, you're going to have missing data, whether you like it or not. Like IRI, you can't get IRI on, on slow speed situations, on short, short sections around traffic signals, stop signs, or high traffic volume. And you only maintain data of consequence. I don't know if people realize that, but you always have data. But the data that you're getting beat up on is what you focus on. Like in the off-system and H, enhancing HS routes, we, we have trouble identifying the bridges because the road used to be First Street, but now it's Martin Luther King and things like that that we never maintained. We never cared about the road names because we always did what we needed to do with the bridges. We knew where they were. Well, so we have like one-time data collections that we captured but didn't maintain, so it's data no longer valuable like our regulatory signs. And different pavement lists and different systems are very hard to keep synchronized. Uh, anytime you have main mainframe freeform data entry, you're going to have issues. Our signal database had ambassador CAFRA spelled seven different ways into seven different signals. Even if you have bad data selection from pick lists, it's just accidental. Next slide. All right. The, the few recommendations we want to make, you have to start as soon as possible. You can't dabble. You, you remember there's penalties and deadlines. And, you know, we thought we were in great position to do all this. We, we really felt like we had everything in line, and it took us a long time to develop our TAMP. Uh, you get bogged down studying other people's TAMP. We, they, we tend to don't want to rewrite our study every time we read somebody else's TAMP effort, and that's not a good approach. Look at them, get a good idea what you want, and then work for it. We developed a plan to do a plan, so you have to develop the, a plan to do your TAMP plan, and you're going to have to set assignments and have working schedules and deadlines for that to get people to give you what you need. And then the one thing is you got to have your local feds um, involved as early as possible. Um, they have more local knowledge of your details. Our, our local feds had many, many uh, responsible comments that were valid and we liked. And they forced us to do the study state budget analysis, gap analysis, and that was like one of the most important things we've done a long time looking at our data. So that was some of our most important uh, findings in, in our area once we got them back involved. They went involved early, left out, and then came back. Um, next slide is the last one. Just questions. I, I kind of rushed through this as quick as I can. 15 minutes is kind of quick. I talk too much anyway, but um, you can go to the, the Fed website. There's a link to our pilot TAMP, and this is also the, the access point. Uh, as we get to the final TAMP, we'll put it more in a frontal position on the website, but right now it's kind of hidden away. But the link from the Feds takes you right to it. If you need to contact me and ask my information, don't be afraid to call or answer any question I can. That's it. I'll give it back to you, honey. Thanks, Mark. Our next presentation from William Johnson of Colorado DOT addresses CDOT TAMP. William is the Transportation Performance Branch Manager for Colorado DOT, where he manages the asset management process and strategic initiatives. He has over 14 years of experience in the transportation industry, all with CDOT. Over his career, he has developed congestion models, reviewed countless NEPA documents, directed the HPMS and Highway User Tax Fund reporting, managed the GIS data management section, and currently leads CDOT's data governance strategy. Now I'll turn it over to William. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. And one of the things that I want to start off with was Colorado's TAMP. We call it the Risk-Based Asset Management Plan, or RBAMP, is we approach this as both it's a requirement for MAP 21 to develop, but also to implement the performance plan. And so what I'm going to be talking about is what Colorado is doing as far as implementation goes. Within our RBAMP, we identified a number of gaps through a gap analysis. The top 10 of them became our implementation plan. And as you can see there, it, it sort of stretches the range of things that we are not 
we weren't currently doing at CDOT at the time of it, the check marks there represent things that we've had significant progress on. And I see through the presentation that the checks are just a little bit off. Uh, one of the success factors I want to point out is if you want to have good slides, hire a graphic designer. Don't expect the manager to do it, especially me, because it doesn't turn out so well. Nevertheless, our executive director at the time, if you're looking at that number one gap, said that is the most important gap to close. So that's the one that we spent a lot of effort attacking early on. Then for us, if you understand why CDOT chose, and remember CDOT is not part of the original FHWA pilot states, we just chose to go ahead and make our risk-based asset management plan. The reason why is it was a business decision. We saw asset management as a good way of doing business. And we actually started the process of developing our asset management plan months before MAP21 came out. <clears throat> that said, we, we did heavily use the ASHTO Asset Management Guidebook very heavily as well as best practices from Australia and uh, New Zealand. So when you're looking at the other gaps here, you're, you're seeing that they are related to business decisions that we have to make when it comes to asset management, especially in regards to risk and budget trade-offs. Next slide, please. One thing I want to point out about CDOT's organization is that we have an informal organizational structure when it comes to asset management, although I do now manage the asset management branch, I rely heavily on the asset managers for the separate asset programs that we have at CDOT. We currently have 11 different asset programs, nine of which were included within our RBAMP. We added two additional ones. Those include, of course, pavement and bridge, but also tunnels, culverts, walls, geohazards, signals, ITS, buildings, road equipment, and MLOS. So in closing that gap number one, how we actually fund our asset programs is we use the wide band Delphi methodology. This is a methodology where you bring a group of stakeholders together. For us, those stakeholders, they include our executive managers, our asset managers, and high level managers from our region offices into a meeting and we have a full day budget meeting where the asset programs present here is our business case this is how much I need in order to achieve our performance targets performance targets I have a slide on that a little bit later so the need is based off of what is the current condition versus what is the target that I want to get to and we typically fund asset programs to reach their performance target within a 10-year period. The other thing that we wanted to get an understanding of is, okay, part of asset management is a budgetary discussion, but a large part of that is how do you spend the money? And that's a project selection discussion. What I have here is examples. Um, it, if you don't want anybody to question what you're doing, give them examples that they can't read on a presentation. I assure you these mean something. There's boxes and lines, and what these boxes and lines represent is what is the decision-making pathway that each of our asset programs have between the time they have a planning budget and the time that they have a treatment option. Those treatment options are then put into projects for our region staff. But for each one of our asset programs, except for maintenance, we have them go through this uh, activity of documenting what their project selection process was. And what this represented was a shift, a fundamental shift in how we did do business. Specifically, what we did before we had these project selection processes, Colorado has a transportation commission. Uh, they're very hands-on in a lot of our day-to-day -day business. We would have to take individual projects to them for approval. Now, through this process, what we did is said, hey, we as staff have a process that we can repeat and, and get expected results and get out good candidate 
pro projects. Uh, those kind of projects are treatments, treatments that extend the life cycle of the asset, but also help us achieve our performance target for the asset programs. And we're asking the commission, since we have these, can you just trust us to develop our projects? And from there, what we did not have to do anymore is take individual projects to our commission for approval. We just take the budget recommendation and say, is this okay? Good, and then we go about our business. Next slide, please. I'm going to fly through these slides and make sure we're on time here. Uh, another thing that we did, this addresses our gaps two and three, is we have robust risk registers. These risk registers include things such as what is the event or occurrence, and for us, uh, we have a score there, likelihood times consequence, but that, that is based off of various factors within it. Factors could include things such as safety or mobility or potential for damage to the asset to occur. Those are all mixed together and we get a risk score. And what you see here is some of our top risk. In addition to the event, the risk score and the uh, occurrences that, I, that calculate or factor into the risk score, you'll see what is the reaction or what, what uh, what remediation things can CDOT do to address that risk. And then you'll see an owner of that risk. Next slide, please. This is something new that CDOT is doing. We're still trying to wrap our hands around it. And when it comes to risk, the thing that we quickly learned with our risk register that you saw from the previous slide is it gets to be a pretty long list. We went very detailed on the risk register. So we wanted to take a very generalized look at it. And the way we did this is we had broken down CDOT system by a quarter profile. And what you see here on this profile is we can generalize it by interstate mountain rural or, or interstate plains rural or interstate plains urban. And from there, what we could do with our risk register is say that these risks have this likelihood of occurring on these corridors. And for us, this is how we actually begin to implement this within the planning phases of asset management, as well as just general planning activities. We get a broad understanding when we're looking at long-range plan for our corridors, what is the probability that any, any of these risks could occur? Next slide, please. Uh, another important thing for CDOT is that we had developed a risk framework early on within our, our planning for our, uh, the asset management plan. We have this stratified along four levels. The first one is agency risk. Agency risk would be something to the effect of, hey, we're, we're CDOT, we don't have enough money to reach all of our performance targets at the same time or to sustain them, what do we do? And then we have a program risk. A risk to this would be Colorado has a, uh, a quasi-public uh, public enterprise. It's called the Bridge Enterprise. And with that, we have a Bridge Enterprise program. The primary purpose of that is to replace or fix the worst bridges in the state. Now, what would happen if that Bridge Enterprise ran out of money? From a program perspective, those are some of the things that we would look at. We also have, on another level, project risk. These are risks that you would associate with what, what are the risks that I have that would delay my project or construction schedule. These could be anything from contracting to environmental risk. And then we have number four, residual risk. This is the everything else. And everything else under this could be Colorado within the past four years has have had more federally declared emergency disasters than any other state. And with that, a lot of those risks fall under residual risks. Those are wildfires, those are flood events. Next slide, please. This goes into our gap five. Um, this is, if you paid attention to the, the uh, TRB newsletter, you'll see that the cross asset optimization publication was recently uh, pushed out. And with Colorado, we have for the past three years been marching down this road of cross asset optimization. 
Of course, you start off with just your basic performance curves. These are one-off curves by asset group. What you're looking at here are some pretty, some very ugly examples of asset curves. This is uh, an example that was actually used during our last budget setting process. And with these, you could see based off of the various scenarios that we have for budget options, what performance will achieve. There's also a line there that says here is the target that you're shooting for. With this type of analysis, the reason why we run so many different scenarios is so we could begin to do trade-off. This is the Rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, for instance, if I wanted my culverts to achieve and sustain their performance target for quicker and for a longer duration, uh, and I see that bridge is exceeding their performance target, what would happen if I take money away from bridge and put it towards culverts? This is the type of information that we bring into the budget workshop. It's a very data intensive activity, but for us what it leads to is when I take that budget recommendation back to our Transportation Commission, they have the authority to say, hey, you're not going to achieve this performance target as fast as I want. And as a policy decision, they can direct how our, our investments are made. Next slide, please. This is a rough example of what that slider tool looks like. Next slide, please. Um, one thing I, I forgot to mention with cross-asset optimization is CDOT will be in late spring, early summer having a cross-asset optimization staff level workshop. And what this will be doing, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in a later slide, is we'll be collecting what is the priority for CDOT. And this may or may not be setting the priority for bridge and pavement are the most important things for the organization. What's likely to occur is that we'll have a discussion on the qualitative benefits that any construction program has. And asset management, again, is about project selection. It's about construction, putting the right treatment uh, at, to the right asset at the right time. Um, and when you do that, you get other benefits like economic development and safety. And what we're trying to gather through our asset management workshop is, well, what are those qualitative benefits that we do when we deliver an asset project? And what are we striving for as an organization? Do we value safety over economic development? Uh, or do we uh, value economic development more than we do mobility? So looking at this current slide, gaps six and seven, this is something new that we're approaching also. This really gets into the decision making and doing business better at CDOT. This is project scope optimization. So I've said multiple times that asset management, a lot of it is budget, but the greater part of it is making sure you're identifying the correct preventative uh, treatments to extend the life cycle and achieve your performance targets. But when we do that, we also want to make sure that we're spending the money wisely. When we go out and invest in culverts, we don't just you know, park a plow uh, or, or backhoe up to a culvert and dig into the culvert. You're touching the pavement also. And oftentimes when you do a pavement project, you're going to be encountering a culvert that may or may not need replacement. What we want to do with project scope optimization is make sure, and this will be through a GIS tool because the analysis is very geographic based, um, make sure that we have an understanding of where certain activities are being recommended uh, versus where we have poor conditions to address versus where we actually have a treatment activity uh, with some funding recommended, mix it all together and get the perfect project. Um, perfect is probably not going to be achievable. What we'd like to do is get the optimal project that can be delivered. And that could include a mix for us, again, going back to those 11 asset programs that we manage under CDOT, uh, could be a mix between bridge, pavement, culverts, walls, uh, and with this geospatial tool we'll be able to begin making some better decisions about how we invest our money. The idea here is that when you bulk projects up, 
um, you make timely decisions on those projects that you'll eventually gain some savings in efficiency. Next slide, please. Target setting, and for us, this, this is one of the key things that leads to both how we allocate the funds available for asset management as well as the treatment recommendations that we have from asset management. For us, we just got all of our performance metrics, our performance targets approved by our Transportation Commission in February. And how we did this was, well, the first time we, our, our first go around at this was, I'm not going to say we took a swag at it. Uh, we took a, a, an educated guess at what the performance metric and performance target would be. And from there, as we started putting things into our asset investment management system and into our asset models, we began to realize that hmm, some of our metrics need tweaking. Uh, we're adding different data to this. Our current performance isn't exactly what we thought. It's changed, and our, our target, which is a fiscally constrained target, it's not going to be achievable based off of the dollar amounts we have. And so we spent quite a few months for nothing what our targets would be and what our performance metrics would be, and that resulted in this list of performance metrics and targets. For us, this is something that is actually adopted by our Transportation Commission as part of their uh, primary policy tool on investment. So for them, it's the, here's their power to make investments in our asset programs, and we as staff take this as our guiding document of what we're trying to do within asset management. Next slide, please. Strategic management framework. Yeah, this, this is something we're still working on. Uh, the, the key thing that I'm trying to express within the strategic management framework is for us, we have to have an understanding of what are the outcomes of our asset management projects. We already know that we go into this using our model, using our performance metric that, okay, you have inputs being budget and a performance target output being the performance curve based on that investment or budget. But those are actually manifested by construction projects, which is just an output. Here's what we did. For us, the outcomes that we're wanting to achieve, again, tie back to what is the total benefit of asset management to Colorado. What is the benefit to safety? What is the benefit to mobility? What is the benefit to congestion? And so on. What are we doing with asset management above and beyond just trying to achieve performance targets? That all occurs within the framework of strategic management. It's a strategy, strategy decision, uh, what we're doing in terms of how we achieve our performance metrics and performance targets. But it's all done under the context of what are we doing to the entire network of CDOT. Next to the last slide, please. Uh, gap 10 was communication, and CDOT has done some rather interesting things when it comes to communicating the benefits of TANS. Uh, we have some usual favorites here. We have an internal website that we post a lot of asset management information on. This includes just general information such as what is asset management, what's included under asset management, as well as who are the people that I contact regarding asset management, but it definitely includes a lot of concepts of asset management that we're working towards. Also, last year, uh, summer, June last year, we had an organizational-wide TAM workshop. It was attended by almost 300 people. Uh, Mark before me spoke to the need to get executive management buy-in on the process. The picture that I have there for the TAM workshop includes our executive director, our chief financial officer, our deputy director, the acting chief engineer at the time. Uh, they all participated in a no holds bar Q&A session at the workshop. So we definitely did get that buy-in from the executive management and sort of held their toe to the fire to explain what it all means to the rest of CDOT. Uh, also, some interesting things that we've done is with that TAM workshop, we did post we recorded and posted the workshop to YouTube. I'm not going to speak to the amount of views or thumbs up or thumbs down 
that we got there. Uh, but it is available in a public setting on YouTube. You can watch the, the videos there. The last one I want to point out is we had made a TAM pamphlet. Um, with this one, uh, we had a little bit of fun, but really what it was is it's a public friendly document that talks about from a high level perspective, what is asset management about, what's included, what are the current conditions, what are the performance targets for asset management, as well as what's next. And that included information on the gap analysis, the top 10 gaps, which I'm talking about now. So I think we'll move on to Q&A later. And I think I got us back on time. Thanks, William. All right, so our next presentation is from Mark Nelson of Minnesota DOT. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to do his, read his bio, but instead turn it over to Mark. Mark? All right, thanks, Jan. Uh, I'll take the hint, and I'll go a little bit quicker than perhaps I had uh, planned to. Uh, again, my name is Mark Nelson. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, I took a little bit different approach to this to this uh, webinar than I have to pass. Uh, we've looked a little more closely at the uh, proposed rulemaking and in looking at our plan and how we developed our plan in light of that, uh, of the proposed rules. Next slide. Um, so again, we were one of the three states, as Mark Suarez pointed out, uh, that went ahead as part of the pilot project for the asset management plan development. It was a it was a very positive experience, um, but we were really working without a without a rope, I would say, or without a net, not a rope. We had enough rope, um, but we uh, we really were doing this after the the uh, uh, the uh, passage of Map 21, but prior to rulemaking. So we were looking at a um, little bit of detail, the little bit of detail that was provided in the in the legislation, and and trying to determine what in fact an asset management plan would look like. Uh, it was, uh, so now uh, we've been waiting for some time and the rules are now out for review, the proposed rules. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to take a look at our plan and how we did it, and specifically at some of the rules and uh, how they would affect kind of our upcoming uh, redraft or revision to our plan. Uh, we of course won't be uh, addressing that revision until the rules are final but I think the, uh, the proposed rules give you a sense of, a very strong sense of the sort of what, what the expectations are going to be for, for the asset management plan. So if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna get a little more detailed here. Um, the, one, the one thing I wanted to say is that I will be talking specifically about the rules and some of the issues we may have with them, but overall this was very much of a positive experience and our, our agency is really much more fo focused on asset management than we were prior to this. So we were very, we're very excited about where we're going with this and we're very grateful to be part of this, this uh, pilot project. So with that, let's go to the next slide. Um, MAP 21 uh, requires that at a minimum, uh, asset management plans address pavement and bridges on the national highway system. MnDOT expanded the scope in this initial effort to include bridges and pavements on the entire trunk highway system as well as other asset types, hydraulic structures, overhead sign structures, and high mass tower light poles to be specific. Uh, our agency along with other agencies, and I think Mark Suarez mentioned that uh, since uh, the 1990s, most of us have had management systems for our pavement and our bridges. So we've been managing these assets as enterprise assets for some time, really using a data-driven and performance-based approach. What we were trying to do with this asset management plan was to really, well, first of all, document our processes for managing these assets as is required, um, but also look for ways to improve. Um, we wanted to also kind of start looking at some of the other assets that we're responsible for and treat them uh, to the same level of rigor as we do pavement and bridge. Uh, that may be a, that may be a, the ideal. We may never ever uh, manage, uh, for example, overhead sign structures to the extent that we manage bridges, but we certainly can move closer to that direction and be a lot more data driven on how we maintain some of our other assets. Um, lastly, we haven't really systematically planned for operations and maintenance activities as an agency, at least to the extent that we do capital investments. Uh, we know that these two areas are, are linked, uh, how, you, how you address uh, preservation activities through your maintenance program, through your internal workforce maintenance program, 
and how you uh, will affect the life cycle of your assets just as much as the, the condition of your assets uh, based on your capital investment levels will affect uh, your maintenance needs. So we really wanted to kind of make that jump, not just look at capital, but really move into uh, into uh, kind of the operations and maintenance side of our business as well when it came to managing our assets. So this was uh, this was a stretch for us. This is well beyond the uh, the requirements of the plan, but we were really looking at this as an opportunity to kind of uh, move forward, not just uh, uh, refine how we did pavement and bridges, but to start to address some of these other areas. Next slide. So this gets to uh, one of the first uh, parts of the rules uh, that we wanted to point out, um, and you'll see the reference on top, uh, the page numbers from the of the Federal Register, so I won't probably mention those again, but uh, so the one area we want to talk about here is if a state DOT elects to include such other assets, all of the analysis and planned content requirements proposed in the rulemaking would apply. So this to us is a little is a little challenging. Uh, we may have to, if this sticks, again, we're, we're dealing with proposed rules, so we'll see how, it, how this all comes out the other end. But uh, right now, uh, we'd probably want to back off because certainly we don't have the level of information, uh, the data, and really the understanding of life cycle for a lot of our other assets that we do for payment and bridge. So if this is in fact kind of the, the direction we go, we'll want to rethink that and maybe just go back to pavement and bridge and wait until we're more comfortable before before adding some of these other assets to our asset management plan. Next slide. Um, in developing our plan, uh, it was required, this was an area of, of a little bit of, of uh, uh, there were differences between the states on how we approach evaluation of our assets. We went in one direction. We uh, we identified uh, our re current replacement value. Uh, that is the cost to reconstruct our system in current year dollars. Uh, this number gives you a sense of the overall size of our system and really the, the relative size of our different assets. So you can see here, just looking at the assets that we did include, uh, pavement and bridge uh, well, first of all, payment is the uh, is by far the largest asset in terms of of value. Uh, uh, bridge is a is a distant second, and collectively, payment and bridge is I would imagine we haven't looked at all of our ancillary assets, but I would imagine that it'll it'll continue to be well over 90% of our total value. Uh, these numbers are interesting. Uh, they help us to make the point when we're talking to the public, uh, and we're we're having budget discussions with the legislature about just generally the magnitude of the system that we're taking care of, but it isn't really a number that allows us to make, that really, I guess, directs specific investment uh, decisions. Um, it, it really is just kind of a, a, a point of, of reference as we, as we talk to others about our assets. And we think about how we're investing in, say, research or um, uh, improvements within each of the asset types. Next slide. So this takes us to the next point from the uh, um, from the rules, and this is I'll just read it. The FHWA proposes including an estimate of the value of an agency's pavement and bridge assets and the need needed investment to maintain the life maintain the value of these assets. Um, clearly, we've used the term value in a way that doesn't really apply to this. This is I think what they're probably referencing is a, um, a depreciated value, uh, which is a and the implicit in that is that you would invest to offset the depreciation of an asset over time. Um, and so it's really a really more of a um, an accounting approach at uh, evaluation, which is absolutely legitimate. We'll have to probably go back and take a look at what our depreciated value for our system is. Um, but if we go on to the next slide, um, what we do really with with the way we uh, we invest is not at a certain funding level, um, but really to meet a certain target. So it's not based on a, on a depreciation curve for a particular asset, but really what is the, uh, the condition of the, of the system and what is the condition we aspire to, to be in. So here are a list of some of our performance measures for these five assets. And as you can imagine, they're, they're all about the condition of the system specifically and the percentage of the system that is in poor condition. Uh, looks like without without any uh, um, exception here. So if you go to the next slide, 
once we've identified the performance measures here we're focusing in on pavement, we then look at uh, desired target. So for us, target and the way we use the, the term target is where we want to be. I saw that Colorado had a column that was aspirational target, and that's how we have historically talked about our target. Um, we know the condition that, it, that we, we aspire to maintain our system in, and this becomes the objective. Um, we also know that we have finite resources that have to be traded off among different objectives, so we have gaps. And uh, often when we talk about our needs, uh, particularly outside the walls of the agency, we, we talk about our performance gap. So the difference between where we, we feel we should be and, and where we are. Um, when we set these targets, you know, they're based on a lot of things, including policy objectives, our assessment of risk, and stakeholder input. So these are these are numbers that that we use to uh, to really set targets over time, and we understand that <clears throat> targets set by uh, through the asset management plan are more or less uh, defined differently than how we've defined targets in the past. So if you go to the next slide, um, so here's a couple other areas where we think. Um, we will have to take another look at how we did our asset management plan and, and depending on how, again, how it comes out with the uh, rulemaking. This is actually from two different uh, uh, rulemaking sets, uh, first asset performance and second asset management plan. The asset performance asks that we develop targets uh, for two and four year for the condition of an infrastructure asset. And then for the asset management plan, we're looking at 10 year uh, investment or excuse me, uh, financial plans that would be required to identify annual costs over a minimum period of 10 years. The second one is really the, the, the approach we would have typically taken. We do a 10-year and a 20-year fiscally constrained uh, capital investment plan as it, as it is, uh, and the asset management plan will certainly affect the way we do that. Um, but it, it seems uh, a little bit of a challenge then to talk about targets in the two and four-year period. Uh, as a state, we have a four-year uh, SIP, or State Transportation Improvement Program. Um, so really, within a four-year period even, our, our program is pretty well set. The projects are scoped. So really, if we have a four-year target, uh, we're really m measuring the extent to which our ability to predict is, is accurate and, uh, and our funding um, is as uh, Reliable as we anticipate, it'll be over that over that short period. It's not really a planning tool at that point. It's more or less a check-in to make sure that um, that we are we are tracking consistently. So, again, for us as a we've, we've been doing performance-based planning for some time. We look further out and we make those trade-offs, not necessarily in the first four years, but <clears throat> excuse me, in the longer term, um, ten years and even and even twenty years. So that that's an area where. Um, we'll likely have to go back and take another look at how we uh, developed our, our TAMP. And with that, we can go to the next slide. Um, and then this is the, the, last, the last rule uh, that really doesn't talk so much about public involvement, but it is required that the, uh, the asset management plan um, requires state DOT to make their asset management plans available to the public and encourages them to do it in a format that is easily accessible. <clears throat> We're completely uh, in, um, on board with that. Um, in fact, if you go to the next slide, um, this is the outcome of our last highway investment plan. This is the, I believe, the 10-year number. Yeah, this is our 10-year um, investment number. We, we look at asset management along with all of the other policy objectives we have in, as an agency. So as you can see there, Safety and mobility are other areas that, that are policy objectives for the state. So um, we have very broad discussions with the public and with our stakeholders about how much should be invested, not only in asset management, but in, toward these other objectives. Um, so really, that is a, a very publicly vetted document. Our 20, it becomes part of our 20-year highway investment plan and meets our federal requirement for a, for a long-range plan. So we are um, constantly out talking to the public about these trade-offs and, and determining the level of, of, um, of investment that's required for assets. So really what the asset management plan does for us is not so much uh, 
it doesn't take the place of this long-range plan, but it really informs the, the, the trade-offs. We start to look at, to, we, we start to better understand the risks involved with funding at certain levels for bridge or pavement, or currently now you see that roadside infrastructure um, slice that will be broken up into the other assets that we've identified through our asset management plan. So we start looking at that, and when uh, we're dealing with the public or our stakeholders, and they're uh, advocating for investing more in another area, we talk about what is the impact of investing less in, in our existing infrastructure or our assets. And now with MAP21, there are, there are greater implications to uh, not investing at certain levels. So um, with our asset management plan and with the, uh, the uh, requirements of MAP21, um, we think we'll have a much more informed conversation with the public. But the point here is that it really is a discussion that we have, um, not only internally as an agency, but, but with our public and with our stakeholders on how we should invest um, to meet all of the objectives that we have as an, as an agency and as a state. Um, next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, uh, for us, the asset management plan uh, was, a, was a very good experience. Uh, we've, we've really refined our, our approach to asset management, we're doing a lot of things, uh, not all of which I will get into, um, but we're certainly enhancing the way we collect information, uh, and particularly for those other assets, so all the other assets that I identified, culverts, stormwater tunnels, overhead sign structures, and, and tower lights. Um, we're doing a better job. We're setting up better inspection protocols for that and looking at um, it, it, researching um, life cycle and getting a better sense of our future liabilities in these areas. Uh, the asset management plan is really going to help us with our next highway investment plan, which uh, is kicking off here in the in the summer and the fall. We're going to have a lot better information to bring out to the public to talk, have that discussion about uh, where we want to go with the state. And ultimately, um, the one area that we've talked about moving into more uh, is is planning for operations. So looking at um, where we're investing our maintenance time, when it, particularly when it comes to these assets, and trying to be more strategic and more data-driven with that. Also, uh, before the paint dries on the draft asset management plan, we're already starting uh, our next version, which will incorporate um, noise walls, uh, pedestrian infrastructure, traffic signals and lights, ITS, and then all of our agency-owned facilities throughout the state. Um, so next slide. So with that brief overview of of our asset management plan in light of some of the uh, some of the proposed rules, I'll uh, I'll hand it back to to the facilitator. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And our final presentation is going to be from Steve Wilcox of New York State DOT, and I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Iana. Um, I'm basically just going to go through six lessons that we learned and five uh, evolving challenges, things that we're starting to think about now, little pearls of wisdom. Um, and rather than saying next slide, I'm just going to go lesson one, lesson two. So when I go to the next lesson, just flip the slide. Um, lesson one, the TAMP, which is next slide. <laughs> um, lesson one, it should tell your story. It's a narrative, not a data dump. Can you guys flip them to the next slide? Um, I think there may uh, be a, a lag in the display here. Okay. Um, so the camps should tell a story. We talked a lot about data, but this is really a narrative and not a data dump. Um, that uh, I often think when it comes to communication, there's a philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, who said, there's really three criteria to effective communication. One, tell the truth. Two, be relevant to your audience. And three, that there needs to be some kind of symmetry condition if there are distortions that come from power relationships where one person may be, you know, willing to penalize you for not, uh, for not complying with something that they, uh, that, you know, that some rule that they establish. Um, for example. Uh, so to tell a story, and this is important because it, we, we probably went through 12 iterations of the TAMP to figure out exactly what the story is. And our story kind of goes like this. 
We've got this infrastructure we're responsible for. It's in the following condition. This is how much money we have to deal with it. And we deconstruct that money to show what's really available to actually go to the highways and bridges and infrastructure assets, um, how we organize to manage these assets, uh, how we, what our strategy is for treating it and really treating the whole system, what risks we face, and given all that, what is the likely end conditions we're going to end up with by using that, those resource, applying those resources using that strategy, and then what we're going to do to improve for the next time around. Lesson two, transparency is good. Um, internally, one thing we learned is it requires working across stovepipes and documents, uh, asset management pr practices for everyone in the agency. Everyone can kind of see, you know, what the overall philosophy is. It's a nexus for design, construction, maintenance, planning, all to see why we're managing the rationale between in, in the way that we manage the resources that we have. Part of this cross stovepipe work is you've got to agree on, on decision time frames, periods of analysis, and things like um, how do you define backlog? We define pavement backlog differently than we define bridge backlog. You know, what counts as a preservation action? What particular treatments are preservation? Because we separate preservation from um, renewal work and how we manage that. So we need to get at definitions that are common across the agency. And also externally it creates a basis for a dialogue with the feds, the MPOs, elected officials, and stakeholders. Lesson three, the TAMP provides a comprehensive planning structure. This is one of the other things that I really loved about the, the, the thought behind the, the asset management planning process is it gives us all as an agency one common understanding of this, 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 these are all the things that are in the planning box that we have to deal with. Um, the the self-assessment, which folks have talked about already, is a great tool to determine what your strengths and weaknesses and performance gaps are. Um, the provider provides some common requirements across the country for asset management and planning. Um, it adds to management of risks, which is something that we really didn't have formally as part of our uh, program development process. And it provides a basis for continuous improvement because also within the philosophy of, you know, transparency and, and structured planning, there is also a process built in say, okay, next time between now and the next TAMP, um, what are we going to do to improve our asset management planning process, which is also helpful. Lesson four, um, project management can't be overstressed. How important project management is, you get information coming from lots of sources, it needs to be coordinated, you need to have a plan. We have a very detailed plan, it's probably 30 pages. Created a team of subject matter experts. And one thing I want to point out here is establish an author with one voice. When you get information coming in from lots of different sources, everyone writes differently. Um, you need somebody who can translate that into one voice if you're going to be able to tell a story. You need to establish deadlines. We establish two um, for the easy to gather stuff and then the hard to gather stuff. Double the time it, uh, to write the TAMP once all the necessary data is in. Uh, it'll take a lot more to get all the time than you think to get all that information coordinated. And double the time you think is necessary for high level review just because folks at that level are hard to get a hold of. Lesson five, external coordination. Um, this is, was mentioned earlier as, as well. Stay closely coordinated with, the, with your uh, federal highway folks. Get them and keep them involved throughout. Realize this is new to your area FHWA office. They may need to rely on the expertise that, that, that exists in Washington. Um, if if you, you folks are, are struggling with you know, what is expected to have your TAMP certified. Stay closely coordinated with your other NHS owners. For us, for example, 10% of the NHS is, is owned by the Thruway Authority. We partnered with them in writing the TAMP. And also consider how to involve your MPOs. Okay, lesson six, stick to the basics. I, 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 for those of you that haven't really gotten deep into the TAMP, I, I would encourage you to, to, to just stick to the stuff that you know really well. You know, we stuck to pavements and bridges. Uh, we did a little bit more than the NHS, but all that's required is the NHS. 
Uh, camp development's a lot of work. It's going to be more work than you think. Each asset class is going to require a full camp analysis and reporting. So be prepared to take it on if you want to put additional assets in. Our philosophy is let's figure out how to do this so we can add more assets later. Um, we also don't know what the impact of the NPRM is. I'm very concerned about the NPRM and how it's going to affect how the TAMP is used by others. Um, and you can, as I mentioned, you can expand asset classes in subsequent TAMPs. Okay, evolving challenges. Uh, these are the things we're starting to think about now as an agency. Um, if we're going to be doing asset management, if we're going to be doing the TAMP every other year, we're going to try to do it on the off year where we're not doing the program update. Um, so this should be a continuous process. The asset management planning should be a process ongoing and not just a report. Um, the TAMP should define your improvement areas, the things you're going to work on in those two years between doing TAMPs, develop policy, treatment strategies, do all that work in between reporting periods, do your external outreach between the reporting periods, and this is where having a core asset management organization, we use a governance process, which I highly recommend, but you need some core asset management organization to drive the work between reporting periods. Okay, evolving challenge two, um, uh, institutionalizing risk management, that's new to us. The new MPRM Rule 52 is raising resiliency as a specific risk that may need to be considered, um, but that is, that is not really well defined. Um, so we need to continue to work on that. Um, again, it's akin to the previous slide, and this work needs to be done between reporting periods. And again, because of that, an asset management organization would be helpful. Evolving challenge three, defining levels of service. We're going to be transparent. We need to learn how to communicate with the public. And we can't just talk about functional class, NHS or non-NHS. We've got to talk about how people use the system and what's important to the commercial transportation folks, emergency responders, commuters, tourists. There are things that matter that are different when you're looking at those different classes of folks. Evolving challenge four, the very hungry NHS. I'm coming to the stuff that, I, that, that really concerns me. Federal funding for NHPP far, now far out exceeds STP. NPRM can tip that balance further with the penalties. States are not picking up the growing funding gap. I, I, sometimes I get the sense that the feds are going to focus on the NHS, asking the states to pick up that gap, and they're not doing it. Um, an asset management plan that concerns itself primarily with the NHS may not paint the entire picture for the public and our elected officials of uh, to, uh, the impact on lower volume roads and bridges. And lastly, seeing it's 3.30, evolving challenge five is the NPRM. I think philosophically there is a fundamental disconnect between the philosophy of asset management planning and the NPRM. The NPRM does not consider current conditions or resources required to meet the legislative performance levels where TAMP targets are set by what the models say is possible. You give us X amount of resources, you can only achieve certain conditions with that, and those aren't necessarily the conditions laid out in the rulemaking. NPRM will likely drive poor decisions, worse first um, approaches to meet the measures, where we'll go and diamond grind pavements just to hit the IRI number, for example. And NPRM will drive minimal asset reporting in order to avo avoid the reporting requirements and penalties that the NPRM imposes. I think that's a serious threat to asset management planning, and I'm hoping that in the comment period that uh, some of that can be overcome. And that's it. Thanks, Steve. I think it's, uh, you know, it's telling that, that we ran out of time, that you all have a lot to share, and I think you could have shared more. So I'm sure there'll be more opportunities at future webinars to get even more deeply into some of the experiences you all are having. If people could just stick with us for a few more minutes, we had a couple of questions, and I'm just going to ask all of them at once and ask each of the panelists to quickly respond. So the, the first question was on whether you're including um, sidewalks and curb ramps as part of your asset management plan um, along the right of way, or if you focus only on bridges 
and roadways only. The second question was on um, using outside consultants uh, for implementation of asset management plans and what services did these consultants provide, what were their roles and what tasks did they perform. And then the final question was, is your long-term plans limited to 10 years? So if we could start with Mark from Louisiana. Okay, I, didn't, I don't have the questions in front of me. So what was the first question? Curbs and sidewalks within your right-of-way? No, we're not doing curbs and sidewalks. Um, we're strictly focused on the pavements and bridges and the initial tamp. There's no telling what we'll do after that, but I, okay. I agree with Stephen, and we need to kind of focus on what we can get done and figure it all out. And ben, you know, Mark Nelson also, you figure it out when you go, and then get there after. The second question was um, use of, of consultants to help you with the implementation, and what services do they provide? All right, we had a consultant involved with our uh, SAP implementation with Agile Assets, and they were still on board, so we extended their task to basically add more bodies to the process. We were shorthanded. Uh, everybody was, you know, we're down to 4,200 employees from 9,700 when I started, and everybody was tasked out, so they picked up the consultant, uh, put some time on it, helped get them to help write uh, the first initial draft of the TAMP. And then I came on board uh, in December, uh, right about the time they were finishing that draft, and then uh, took it over from there. So, yeah, we used a consultant because we just needed extra hands on board. And then we, of course, yeah. had, because we were on a pilot state, we had Jonathan and those guys uh, with the group, too, the consultant help. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then um, is your time frame for uh, the time horizon 10 years for your camp? On the TAMP, it's 10 years. I think that's a requirement. Um, we we try to look past 10 years. Our budgets uh, are defined for 10 years, but when we start looking at our issues with bridges, bridges, 10 years and bridges is not a good mix. You got to look out past 10 years on your bridges to to look at your gap analysis, long-term gap analysis, and issues that are going to come up. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mark. William. Yeah, I'll just go down the list of uh, questions. No curb ramps and pedestrian. The multi-use pathways are not part of our TAMP. However, we do realize that um, any time that you're going to have a construction activity that's going to be adjacent to or disturb the pathway or curb ramp, that you need to provide funding for that. So certain asset programs have guidelines developed uh, and it's documented within the project selection process how they actually deal with curb ramps, specifically the sidewalks and multi-use pathways, not necessarily. Um, the second question about consultants in the implementation, the answer is yes. Um, Colorado, we chose to work with Cambridge Systematics as well as Red Engineering, it's a local firm out of Colorado, to develop our asset management plan and we kept them on board when it comes to dealing with our, uh, addressing our gaps. So I had a graph on there dealing with project scope optimization. That's coming directly from Red Engineering. And so we're, we're very much utilizing the professional services of consultants. Time frame, our TAMP is written for 10 years when it comes to the financial analysis outlook as well as the performance targets. Um, however, when we, in the implementation phase, the data we look, like, look at is typically a 10-year horizon or greater. So although it's the requirement for the TAMP, uh, as I said before, is 10 years, operationally we look at minimally 20 years. Thanks, William. Mark? Nelson. All right. Uh, well, first of all, for uh, serves and curb, curbs and sidewalks, um, I, we do have our pavement model does assume that in in metro or urban areas, urban segments, uh, more extensive pavement fixes are going to uh, get into uh, um, replacement of, of curbs and sidewalks. So we have a higher cost estimate. So in that sense, yes, our our, our asset management plan and our 
our payment model does address that to some extent. Um, we're also, as I mentioned, one of the next uh, systems that we're looking at is uh, is is pedestrian facilities. Um, so that would be sidewalks and um, ramps. So we we are looking at that. The second question was uh, consultant. Uh, yes, we used uh, applied pavement technology. Um, they were very much of a supplement to us. They they came in with a lot of um, experience with what had gone on nationally with asset management, a lot of the work that, that led up to MAP21, so they were of, of great use. Um, I think the one thing we learned from that was that we are the experts on how we currently do things, so we ended up uh, making sure that uh, we really used them. We were much more effective at using them on, on areas where we had less expertise, so they were really, the, in this sense, consulting as the technical experts for us, and that worked, that worked very, very well. Um, and the third question, I, it escapes me. Ten, uh, ten year. Ten year time frame. Ten year time frame. Yeah, or, we did a ten, we did, right. We did a ten year time frame, and we set ten year targets for the asset management plan. But we actually do a twenty year um, capital investment plan for our highways. So we we uh, we set targets at ten and twenty years, and we do uh, it, we talk about how we're going to invest over that time to meet those targets. Thanks. Mark, Steve. In terms of the assets, like I mentioned, we're doing just pavements and bridges uh, in the, the current camp, but we are engaged with Agile Assets and we are, uh, we just launched the bridge inventory and inspection system, uh, or the bridge data information system. We are now uh, engaged with them on pavement management, bridge management, and bridge management is really structures management, so that'll include culverts, overhead sign structures, walls. And then we're going to be doing maintenance management, which will include rail and signs, and we're going to be doing asset trade-offs. So as all of those areas, as we get more sophisticated and develop decision models in those areas, um, as long as the NPRM doesn't keep us from, from uh, wanting to add more assets, we will, as those become more sophisticated, our plan is to add those to the camp. In terms of consultants beyond Agile, um, we, our, our good friends with Federal Highway, um, uh, supported us through uh, AMAC and C Cambridge Systematics, who really helped us when it came to that one author voice taking all in this sort of tower of babble of information and narrative that we had and converting it into something that really could read as a story. And they were profoundly helpful with that. And then in terms of the 10 year um, uh, modeling, uh, because our financing is so volatile, um, we basically have a five-year program that we flatline double for, from a financial standpoint and use that um, to do 10-year projections. I, I, uh, I um, appreciate Mark's comment when it came to, uh, Mark Suarez's comment when it comes to bridges, because a 10-year window for a bridge, if you're looking at life cycle management, um, you, you, we had waves because 47% of our bridges were built between 50, 55 and 75. You have to account for when uh, those long periods of construction, intense periods of construction were, and how that's going to affect your plan. Thanks, Steve. So thank you to all of our panelists and all of you in the audience today for sticking with us. This has been a really valuable webinar. Um, checking in on where um, the, some of the, the, the early TAMP development states are with their implementation. Our next webinar is on Transportation Asset Management Financial Plans, Part 2. I think the Part 1 was the largest uh, number of attendees we've had in this webinar series. Um, this webinar is going to be held on June 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope you'll be able to join us for that. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody.